Grab your Bibles. I have, maybe you're still in Acts chapter 20. If you're still in Acts chapter 20, just look at the memory verse again. Verse 21, Acts 20, 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God. The title of the sermon tonight is Repentance Toward God. I'll be preaching on the topic of repentance. Now, this is such a controversial topic. I mean, it, it, just across Christianity, across churches that should know better. Okay, if you remember last week, I preached on salvation by grace through faith, right? And it's so easy to prove that there's nothing we can do. It's so easy to prove that the deeds of the law cannot get any man saved, no matter how much you try to keep the commandments of God. Okay, and it, it, you know, salvation is purely by faith on Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And unfortunately, this message is not received very well. Okay, by, by Christians, it's not received very well by even independent, some, I'm not saying all in general, okay, but some independent fundamental Baptists can't even receive uh, this simple teaching. So what they do is they take the doctrine of repentance and they add words to the gospel using repent, the word, word repentance. And so this is a really dangerous thing because instead of just being outright, I, I would prefer someone just come out and say, I believe in work salvation. I'd rather just, just that honesty. I would respect that person more than someone that tries to hide works for salvation using the word repentance. Okay? Now, if we, 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 when we looked at Acts chapter 20, I'll just see where, where it was at. Um, look what it says in verse 29. He says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Okay? So he says, look, as soon as I leave you guys, I'm, I'm telling you, Within yourselves, within your own churches, there's going to be grievous wolves that come in, teaching false doctrines. Okay, this is the, the, what wolves do. They go to the sheep and want to destroy what God has put together. They want to destroy the flock of God. Verse 30, And also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, and to draw away disciples after them. Within yourselves. This is why I'm telling you, this is such a dangerous thing because you have the wolves, they look like every other Christian. You know, I hope there's no wolf among us today. Okay, but what they do, they go after the flock to draw away disciples after them. Okay, to teach their wisdom, to teach their doctrines rather than sticking to the Word of God. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about, uh, let's see, I'll get you guys to turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1. Turn there. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1. Because this doctrine of repentance is a doctrine even churches that, that believe just like us are afraid to preach against. Okay? And I'll tell you why they're afraid to preach against it. It's because their churches are full of people that believe in works gospel, a works-based gospel, and other believers that teach it's by faith alone. And in order to not upset their church, in order to not cause any kind of strife or divisions, in order to not stand on... Because look, this is the truth. You stand on the Word of God, there's going to be opposition. Every time. Okay? So in order to maintain peace, they would rather just maintain the peace of the church. They, they almost like don't, don't care if half the church believes in a workspace gospel. And so, you know, they rather just not preach on this. Even churches that believe like us. Because they feel like, oh no, it's too divisive. We shouldn't be teaching this stuff. Hey, if it's a workspace gospel, if half your church believes in a workspace gospel, and if you love them, aren't you going to try to teach them the truth? Aren't you going to try to tell them that salvation is by faith alone? You know? So I don't really understand their hearts. I don't, I don't understand why they do this, but they're afraid to bring up this topic. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So did John the Baptist come preaching repentance? Yes, right? Repent ye. Go to the next chapter, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did Jesus come preaching repentance? Yes. We see this consistency so far, right? John the Baptist, now uh, Jesus Christ. And I'll quickly read to you from Mark 6, 7. He, the Bible says, And he called unto him, speaking of Jesus, he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, 
and gave them power over unclean spirits. And then verse 12 says, And they went out and preached that men should repent. So we have John the Baptist preaching repentance. We have Jesus Christ coming, preaching repentance. Then we have Jesus taking his 12 disciples, sending them out, and what are they preaching? Repentance. So the first thing I just want to bring to your attention, do I believe in repentance? Yes. Do I believe it's essential for you to be saved? Do I believe someone must repent to be saved? Yes, I do believe that. Okay? But again, we need to understand this because so many will use this word and bring in works as part of their gospel message. Okay? And, and just like those deceiving wolves that would come in and not spare the flock. Now, I'm not a big fan of going back to the Greek. Okay? Going back to the Greek. Uh, but in this case, we will. Okay? Now, I'm not sure how much you guys know about this topic of repentance and going back to the Greek, but the main word that the Bible uses, the main Greek word, is the word metanoia. Okay, you guys probably have heard that before. Metanoia, but it's not the only word used to translate repentance in the, in the English Bible. There's also, and I'm probably going to mess up how to pronounce this, but anyway, there's also metanoia and metanoel. Okay? Basically, the same thing. Every, every one of those are saying meta, 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 okay? And then a slightly different way of saying that noia thing. It's kind of like, just like repentance with us. We would say someone's repenting, someone has repented, you know, we believe in repentance. So it's the same kind of idea, it just depends on the grammar, why you would use a uh, slightly different word. But they essentially mean the same thing, okay? Now that word meta, if you don't know, means change. You know, when we talk about metamorphosis, you learn that in high school, when a tadpole becomes a frog, we say that's a met a metamorphosis that takes place. Where the animal is changing its form. From a tadpole, it's growing, it's, dropping, it's losing its tail, it's growing its legs, and it's becoming, you know, a frog. Okay? That's a, a metamorphosis or a, a caterpillar that transforms itself into a butterfly. When it gets cocooned, it goes through that process of metamorphosis. Because the word meta just means change. Okay? So, metanoia also means change. But you might say, well, change what? What are we changing when we talk about repentance? Well, there's the, think of the word metanoia. And now think of the English word you're familiar with. That's the Greek word. You're familiar with the English word paranoia. Okay, when someone's paranoid, what are we saying? We're saying that um, they're, they're afraid. They're, they're commonly thinking about things that are scaring them, that, that are making them afraid. They might be afraid to step out of the house or whatever. They're paranoid, okay? Paranoia. They're afraid of something, okay? But it has to do with the mind, okay? That, that something they're thinking about that is scaring them out of their wits. That's why we call them paranoid. Or parano That's where the, word, the Greek word, the paranoia, is of the mind. Meta is change. So what is metanoia? Change your mind. Change your mind. That's what metanoia comes from. That's the Greek. But if we can go back to the English, repent. Now, a lot of words in English start with RE, okay? And when it comes to the word repent, the RE is a prefix of the word. Kind of like when we talk about repeat. When we say, you know, you repeat something, it means you do it again. Or we talk about replenishing a cup of water. What are we saying? If we say replenish, we're saying it has to be filled again and again and again, okay? It's something rep that uh, you repeat, okay? So repent, first of all, re is to do it again, then pent, you say, well, what's pent? Well, when you talk about someone being pensive, what are you saying? We say, this person is very, you know, if I see you there in deep thought, I'd say, wow, you know, that person's very pensive today. Okay, they're in deep thought. Okay, pensive. Or, you know, in Spanish, some of you guys know Spanish, pensar is to what? To think. Okay, so repent is what? Rethink. Okay, that's the English et etymology. The Greek, change your mind. English, rethink. It's the same idea, right? You thought this, and now you think that. You, you know, um, you've changed your mind, it was that, but now you've changed your mind, and it's this. That's what the word repent means. It doesn't mean anything more than that. Okay? Now, does it doesn't mean repent of your sins. Well, it can, just depending on the context, right? Maybe, you know, you're all here, but I don't know, I hope, you know, there's no one that, is, that thought of coming to church tonight, but then they're not here, they decided not to come, guess what? They repented. 
Okay, they were going to do something and then they've decided, they changed their mind and they've decided. Have you ever changed your mind? Have you ever thought of doing one thing and then you've just done another thing? Then if you've done that, you've repented. Okay, it doesn't have to be a negative thing. It's not like you've turned from a bad thing to a good thing. It could be. You could be that you turned from a good thing to a bad thing. It could be. It could be something from neutral. You know, uh, you know, you felt like having orange juice, so you decided to have a glass of water instead. Neutral. You know, it's not good or bad. You know, it's just you've, done, you've thought of one thing, you're doing something else. Okay. Now in Spanish, uh, Dad, what's the word for repen uh, repent in Spanish? Arrepentir. Arrepentir, yeah. If you go to Chile, if you go to South America, you're going to hear that word over and over again. It's just part of the common vernacular there. You know, that when we say change, we change our mind. They say that, you know, and that's basically repentance. Every time they were planning on doing something, they change their mind, that's what you're going to hear. Arrepentir, okay? But unfortunately, in our English language, we don't hear that as our modern day vernacular. We don't say that. We don't use that word repent. The only place you hear it is within a church sort of function or when you're reading the Bible. And so the problem is, when a society is no longer using that word, you're going to have the grievous wolves come in and change the meaning of that word. Because nobody can say otherwise. It could be. It could be what they're saying, right? Because we, we don't know. We don't use it in our society anymore. And so because it's been dropped in our usage, in our common everyday usage, it's easy to come in and taint what it means. And more often than not, people will tell you that means you've got to turn from your sins. You will live in a life of sin, and now you've got to stop doing that. Okay? You've got to basically obey the commands. Now, repentance is all about context. It can mean anything. Okay? Um, you might have been dr driving, you thought, oh, I'll turn left. No, you decided no, I'm going to go straight. Okay? I was on my, uh, when I landed here, I had two options. I could have gone central to Fairfield. No, sorry, I could have gone Glenfield to Fairfield. I changed my mind. It was quicker to go to central to, fair, to Fairfield. I, I repented at that point, you know, today. So it's just, it just depends on the context. Now, please turn to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. And let's go to verse 17. Exodus 13, verse 17. I just want to prove to you very quickly that repenting does not mean turning from, uh, going from something bad to something good. Okay? Let's just have a look at this. Again, it's all about the context. It's all about the context. Exodus 13, verse 17. This is the story after Israel had left Egypt, okay? They had left Egypt, and God was concerned that the Israelites might go back to Egypt, okay? Look at verse 17. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. Okay? So, it would have been, uh, I guess, quicker, a more direct way to go through the land of the Philistines. But because there was war in that land, God says, I'm not going to take them that way. Because if they see the war and they freak out, they get scared, it might cause them to repent and go back to Egypt. Now, let me just say this. When they left Egypt, was that a good thing or a bad thing? It was a good thing, right? So to go back to Egypt is what? A bad thing. Okay? So I just want to show you the context of repentance here is they were doing something good and God was concerned that they would repent and do something bad. Okay? So repentance is not going bad to good. Like I said, it can be either way. It can be any way. Or it can be neutral to neutral. It really doesn't matter. It comes down to the context. Okay? Now, the, the big problem is this repentance from your sins. Now you say to me, Kevin, do you believe we should repent of our sins? Absolutely, I do. I, I do. Okay? You say, do you think we should be willing to turn from our sins? Oh yeah, I think you should be willing to do that. Okay? I think that shows good maturity, good growth as a Christian. I say, oh, Kevin, do you think we should be sorrowful for our sins? Absolutely, I think you should. I think you should feel bad when you've sinned against the Lord and feel guilty before Him. All those things I truly believe. But I don't believe any of those things are required for you to be saved. The Bible does not teach that any of those things are required for you to have eternal life. As we learned last week, what's the one requirement? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay? So whatever repentance is, when it comes to the context of salvation, it must be consistent with salvation by grace through faith without the works of the law. Okay? It must be consistent. Otherwise, God's being contradictive. Okay? Now, you guys, maybe some of you guys already know this. But who repented the most in the Bible? 
Out of everybody in the Bible, all the, all the characters we have in the Bible, who repented the most? Now, it was the Lord God. It was God Himself. In fact, He's the very first person that repents in the Bible. It's in, I'll just quickly read to you Genesis 6.6. 6. This is about uh, Noah, the story of Noah. It says, And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him in His heart. By far more than anyone in the Bible, the one that repents the most is our Lord God. Okay? So that should automatically tell you, unless you believe God's a sinner, which that's just crazy, all right? otherwise He can't even save us, okay? He can barely say, can't even save Himself. No, our God is holy, our God is without darkness, in Him is light, okay? He's righteous, He's without sin. In fact, God hates sins, okay? And to say, well, the, the one character that repents the most is the Lord God, and then, and then to define repentance as a turning from sins, it doesn't make any sense if God has no sin. Okay? The fact that God has no sin and God can repent automatically proves that repentance does not mean turning from your sins. Automatically. Okay? I mean, I, that's it. We're done. Finish, so it's finished, right? But that's how it should end, right? We've proven it once. God repents. It can't be turning from sin. But unfortunately, I told you, there are grievous wolves in good churches, in good independent fundamental Baptist churches that are preaching false doctrines, using this doctrine of repentance as their, as their way to get works into the gospel. Okay? Now, what, when we talk about repenting, okay, we're going from one thing to another thing, aren't we? We're changing our mind from that to that. Okay? Now, in our memory verse, what are we repenting to? What is, what is salvation? When we talk about salvation... What or who are we repenting to? Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. The reason why I wanted this to be a memory verse is because I want to show you just it's both the Jews and the Greeks. It's, the, the, the gospel is the same for both. There's not like a special gospel just for the Jews and, and then the Greeks or the Gentiles, it's some other gospel. No, it's both. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God. Right? Repentance toward God. And what does that look like? And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So when we talk about salvation, we know it's by faith, and we know repentance is important. What are we repenting to? The Lord God. How? By placing our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what, that's what we're repenting to. To God. How? Through Jesus Christ. Okay? So, what's changing there? What's changing when we place our faith on Jesus? What has changed? Our faith. Okay? Our faith has changed. So you're, the question is, well, we know what, it's, what, it needs to be, what it needs to go toward. What did it come from? Well, whatever else your faith was placed upon before that. Okay? And you guys know, you guys go door knocking, you knock doors, you ask people if they're sure of heaven, they say, I hope so. You say, well, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? Nine out of ten people will say to you, I'm a good person. I've done good works. I've done, done good deeds. I think I'm going to make it to heaven based on my good works. So what, what's their faith placed upon? So. Themselves, their own works. Okay? So what, are, what do they need to repent from? Okay? Where their faith was. Their faith was on their works. Their faith was on themselves, their faith was on their church, or whatever. Now you need to take that faith, all of it, and place it all on Jesus Christ. That is true repentance for salvation. This is why I'm saying to you, everybody needs to repent. Even if it's just from unbelief. Okay? You didn't believe Jesus Christ could save you. Now you do. Oh, I didn't believe, so I take my faith. Now I place that on Jesus Christ. That's repentance. That's the change of mind that takes place. Now... There are three places in the Bible, and I want to give you this information because I want you guys to be wise. Wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Okay, uh, I'll get you to, turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Because we know what we need to repent toward. Okay, and there are three places in the Bible that tells us what we're repenting from. Three places in the Bible. Okay, now again, the wolf. Okay. The false prophet will say to you, well, you've got to repent from your drunkenness. That's what they'll say. Oh, you've got to repent from your fornication. You've got to repent from your lying. You've got to repent from your 
wicked thoughts or whatever. They, they're gonna, that's what the false prophet's going to tell you. And you just tell them, can you please show me in the Bible how repenting from those things get me saved? That's what you're going to That's what you're gonna ask them. But I want to show you that there are sins. Pay attention now because this is, I want you to be wise. Don't worry about it. That you do need to turn from. Okay. Now Mark chapter 1 verse 14. Mark chapter 1 verse 14. It says, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now pay attention to this. Jesus Christ is preaching the gospel, right? Verse 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's the message of Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. Okay? So what are they repenting from? If God, Jesus Christ is telling them, believe the gospel, that's what you need to do. What are they repenting from? Not believing the gospel, right? They didn't believe the gospel. Repent from that. Now believe the gospel. Does it say here, repent of your sins and believe the gospel? No. It says, repent ye. Well, what's the context? Believe the gospel. In other words, they didn't believe the gospel prior to that. So they're repenting from unbelief. Okay? Repenting from unbelief. Now, uh, Hebrews, if you guys can turn... Actually, no. Turn to Acts 17. You guys turn to Acts 17. <coughs> what? <coughs> While you're turning there, <coughs> Acts 17, I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 6 verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto perfection. Talking about believers... So let's, let's leave the, 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 the basic things. Let's move on into perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Repentance toward, uh, from dead works. That's the second thing you need to repent from. If you're trusting in your dead works. Those that believe that they're a good enough person, they believe they've done the works. The Bible says those are dead works. Because they're without God. They're like filthy rags to God. They think they're righteous. They think they're good. God says, no, it's just dead works. And you need to repent from those dead works. You need to repent from trusting in those works. Okay? Because again, it's your faith. Where is your faith placed? It's not like the works. It's not saying stop doing the works. It's just saying repent from that. Place your faith on Jesus Christ. Okay? It's where your faith is at. That's what's important. That's the second thing the Bible tells us that we need to repent from. Unbelief. And from dead works or from works. Now you guys are in Acts 17. Look at verse 29. Acts 17 verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, and now commandeth that all men everywhere to repent. Okay, they need to repent. From what? What we just read. They thought God of, of silver, of stone. They had false gods. They had false idols that they worshipped. Statues. Just like the Roman Catholic Church. They've set up their statues in their images. Hey, that's what God expects them to repent from. Okay, to so the true God. Verse 31. Because He have appointed a day in the which He would judge the world in righteousness by that man, referring to Jesus Christ, whom He have ordained, whereof He have given assurance unto all men, in that he have raised him from the dead. So what are they repenting from? Their idols, their statues, their gods of gold and, and images and graven by art. To who? To the one who rose from the dead, Jesus Christ. Okay, the judge of all men. So what, what's the third thing we see here? That you're going to repent from your false idols or your false religions. Okay, false religions and, and put all your faith on Jesus Christ, the true Jesus Christ of the Bible. Now, this is where they get tricky. This is where the false prophet, this is where the wolf will get tricky with you. Say, well, hold on. Is unbelief a sin? Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, well, you know ha putting your faith on works, is that a sin? Yes, it is. Uh, what about your faith on false religions and idols? Is that a sin? Yes, it is. Okay, so you've got to repent of your sins. There you go. You need to repent of your sins to be saved. But when they say repent of your sins, first of all, yeah, it's true. I, I admit you do have to repent from, some, from sins, some sins. But it's the sins of where your faith was placed. Okay? The sin of where your faith, your, your faith was placed on the wrong things. It wasn't placed on Jesus. That's what you need to repent from. It's your faith to Jesus Christ. Okay? But this is what they'll say. They'll say, well, see, you do have to repent from sins. Therefore, you need to turn from your drunkenness. 
You need to turn from your fornication. You need to turn from whatever. Just list all the sins. Just come up with whatever sins you want, right? Just, and it's always the big sins. You know, it's always the big things because they feel like maybe they've overcome those things. But they don't think about all the little sins that they have in their mind. All the wicked thoughts and, and that they have. Or even just the fact that they're preaching a false doctrine. And it's one of the worst sins you could possibly do. I mean, that's going to damn you. That's, uh, people preaching a false doctrine, people fe- uh, preaching a false gospel, preaching works, they're going to split hell wide open. They're, they're going to suffer that, that book. Because it's not just themselves that they're deceiving, but they're deceiving multitudes into going to hell with them. Okay? And so, what they want to say to you, it's a repentance of your works. You were once doing bad works, sins, now you've got to do the good works. No, the repentance is not of your works for salvation. The repentance is of your faith. Where was your faith at? Now it needs to be 100% on Jesus Christ. Okay? So, make sure you keep that in mind. Okay? Yes, there are some sins that you're turning from, but those sins are the sins of, of the faith. Misplaced faith. Not of your works. Okay? It's not of works. We've already seen that last week. Okay, now, let's talk about some false repenting for salvation doctrines that are out there. Okay, the most popular one, we really dis- we discussed this, is to turn from your sins. They'll say, in order for you to be saved, you must turn from your sins. And, and they preach this boldly. It just drives me insane. Turn from your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know full well, the man saying that is full of sins. You know full well that man has not gone a single day without sinning once. And they're telling you, you've got to turn from your sins. Okay? You're, you, as soon as someone says that, you know they're a false prophet. Pretty much. Okay? Because it's something they haven't even done. Now, uh, I don't know, where should I get you to turn? I'll get you to turn to, just to get you guys prepared, turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And I'm going to read to you from 1 John 3, 4. 1 John 3, 4. And they say, Kevin, it sounds so good. You've got to repent of your sins to be saved. I've prayed that my whole life. 1 John 3, 4. The Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. I want this to sink in into your hearts. I want you to understand this. I preached about this last week. I really want to uh, make sure you, uh, you fully understand when someone says to you, what is, sin? what is sin? Turn to 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. No one debates that. Everyone agrees that's what sin is. Okay? So think about this. Kids, I really want the kids to pay attention now. If sin is breaking God's laws, and you say to someone, you need to turn from your sins, you need to stop sinning, what are, you, what are they saying? If sin was tr- breaking the law, but stop sinning, what, what does that mean? It means keep the law. Okay? Because if you're, if you're not sinning, what are you doing? You're keeping the law of God. Now, this is how tricky they are. They come behind the pulpit, say, you've got to repent of your sins. But really what they're saying, you've got to keep the law. You've got to keep the Ten Commandments. You've got to keep the commandments of God. But they won't say those words. That's why they're so deceptive. They won't say those words. Because they know people in the church will stand up and say, Hey, you're teaching a false gospel. You might be a false prophet. Get this right. So instead of saying that, instead of just saying what they truly believe, Oh, you've got to repent of your sins. Stop sinning. Which means, without them saying it, keep the law. Okay, so we know what it means to transgress, to break God's laws. Now, it's the thing about sinning, guys. It's not just doing wrong. Okay, we, we know that sin is a transgression of the law. I'm just going to read from you uh, James four seventeen. The Bible says, "Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin." You know, sin isn't just breaking God's laws and doing wrong. Sin is when you've got something to, that's right to do, something good to do, and you don't do it. You know, you should read your Bible every day. You should be confessing your sins to the Lord. You should be maintaining a close fellowship with the Lord. You should be going to church. But those are all good things. But if you don't do that good thing, guess what? You just sinned. You may not have done something bad. You know, you haven't like lied or stolen or done anything like that. But you, it was a chance to do good. You refused to do that good. That's a sin. It's a sin in the eyes of God. Okay, so there's two ways of understanding sins. That's the sin of commission and the sins of omission. 
The sins of commission are the, are the ba- are, 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 is when you transgress the law of God. And the sins of omission, omission means to remove something, is when there's something good and you don't do that good thing. Okay? There's the, those two uh, sins. Now, you guys are in Romans 3. Romans 3 verse 24. Romans 3 verse 24. <laughs> Because honestly, think about these, think about these preachers. You, you must repent of your sins. What are they saying? It's always the sins of commission. They never talk about the sins of omission when they preach that stuff. Right? Because I'm sure there are things that they could have done, there was good things that they could have done that they didn't do that day. Okay, and they've sinned. But they don't talk about that kind of stuff. Right? But we know what sin is. We know that sin is the transgression of God's law. Romans 3.24. Romans 3.24. Being justified freely by His grace. Guys, we're justified freely. It's a free gift by His grace. We didn't deserve it. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Do you guys know what that word propitiation means? It means it's all sufficient. It's all taken care of. Okay? So, God has set forth to be a propitiation. How? How is it all taken care of? Through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Verse 26. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness. Whose righteousness are we declaring when we get saved? It's His righteousness. It's not your ability to turn from your sins. It's not your ability to keep the law of God. And sometimes I ask, you know, it's, it scares me. I ask people that I think are saved, you know, you know t- tell me about your, 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 your testimony. How did you get saved? Oh, I repented of my sins. I started to go to church when I was this much old. I was preaching behind the pulpit when I was doing this. I'll never forget, I knocked on the door of a guy from the Salvation Army. You know, and I, I got used to, well, everyone's, you know, trusting in their works, trusting in their works. Finally, knock on this guy's door, he goes, oh, it's my faith. I'm like, oh yeah, maybe this guy's saved. You know, I got excited. And I said, well, and then I asked him, well, what's your faith on? What, what do you, you know, I'm expecting to say Jesus, right? What's your faith on? Well, I've been serving the Salvation Army for 40 years. I was doing this, I was doing that, I was doing this. Of course I'm saved. It's like, oh man, are you kidding me? Whose righteousness are you declaring? Whose righteousness are you rejoicing in? His own righteousness, not even the righteousness of Christ. But look, if you don't, if you don't understand this, you're going to think, oh, that guy's saved. That guy's a Christian. He talks about Jesus. He talks about... No. He's trusting in his own righteousness. Okay? Sorry, I don't know where I was up to. Verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? That's what they're doing. I've done this. I've done that. I've gone to church my whole life. I was in the choir. I was a Sunday school teacher. I was this. No. Verse 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith. That's not how he finishes. Without the deeds of the law. Without the deeds of the law. So if you're telling someone you've got to turn from your sins to be saved... What they're saying is you've got to keep the law. No, without the deeds of the law. Justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So important, guys. Don't take it for granted that as a church we stand strong on these things. Don't. Because there are so many churches that will tell you, yeah, 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 we believe by grace through faith. And then behind the pulpit, oh, you've got to repent your sins to be saved. You know they haven't even done it themselves. How can any man stand behind the pulpit and say, look, I've repented of all my sins. I'm so good. Look at me. No. Boasting. Okay, they're trusting in their works. And, um, I don't know, where can I get you to turn next? Um, I'll get you to turn to Luke 24, 47. Luke 24, 47. And as you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from John 3, 10. I think a lot of you guys know this one anyway. Because people say to you, no, 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 Kevin, you're so confused, Kevin. Repenting from your sins is not a work. It's not a work. Okay? Okay, well, Jonah 3.10. I'll just read it to you quickly. And God saw their works. You guys know the story of Jonah? He went to Nineveh. He preached judgment and damnation. He didn't even tell them, clean up your lives. He didn't say anything to them. He said, look, God's going to judge you. going to destroy your city. 
Thank God that city had enough fear of God to go, you know, man, we, we better give this one last shot. Let's, let's fix ourselves up before God so he doesn't destroy our city. And they do. They do fix themselves up. Even God's impressed. Okay? And then he says this. God says in verse, in chapter, uh, verse 10, And God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way. This is a good thing. They had turned from their sins. And God says, I saw their works. So when someone says, I've turned from my sins, what are they saying? I've worked. I've done the works. And then it says, and God repented of the evil. And this is is what's funny. It's God that repents. God repented of the evil. And by the way, evil does not mean sin. Okay, we'll cover that some other point, other, other time. And God repented of the evil, which he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. So it's God that repents. God has no sin. He didn't turn from sins. It's Nineveh that repented of their sins. They repented of their wicked ways. And God says that was works. He saw their works. Okay? So we need to understand the Holy Spirit is the narrator of the Bible. And the Holy Spirit says repenting from your evil ways, from your wicked ways, is works. So am I going to trust a preacher? I don't care who he is that says to me repentance of your sins is not works. Or am I going to trust the Holy Ghost that wrote the Bible to tell me that it's works? That's what you have to decide on. You either decide the Holy Ghost tells us this, or I'm going to trust this well-known preacher that says you've got to turn from your sins. Anyway, guys, turn to Luke. Are you guys in Luke 24, 47? Luke 24, 47. Because I've had a pastor say this to me. Luke 24, 47. That he, he, he should know better, and he does know better. Okay, both, both those things. He should know, and he does know better. Okay, he said to me, no, no, Kevin, you got it wrong. Repenting from sins is in the Bible. Now, first of all, if you think repenting of sins is in the Bible, you need to show me where it is in the Bible. Okay, and it's not in there. Okay, nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Okay, nowhere. You know where it's found? In the Book of Mormon. That's where it's found. It's found in the Book of Mormon. So if you want to be a Mormon and think you can be saved by repenting of your sins, well, that's, that's you know, get out of here. <laughs> this is not the church for you. You know, this church believes in the Bible, okay? And there's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to repent of your sins. You know, that, 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 that's a shock to a lot of people. I don't know if you ever, you know, but it's true. But this is what I got. No, 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 here it is, Kevin, here it is. Luke 24, 47. Let's have a look at it. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. There it is. Do you see it? There it is, guys. Uh, you know, this sermon was a waste after all. There it is. There's the repentance of your sins that you need to do to be saved. Now, it says, and that repentance, and we already know what repentance means, means to change your mind and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now, the reason I wanted to bring this up is, again, I just want to make you guys wise. And by the way, when it says remission of sins, our remission basically means to be released or to be discharged. Okay, so obviously we want to be released or discharged from guilt of our sins, from the punishment of our sins, right? Um, now, the question is, how do we get that remission of sins? Okay, so I want you to understand this, because they, they might use this against you, and they, they found the word repent, and they found sins, and kind of, uh, there it is in one verse. Okay, now you guys turn to Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10 verse 43, Acts chapter 10 verse 43. I'm not going to turn to all the references, just so we can speed along. Go to Acts 10 43. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 26, 28. Matthew 26, 28. That's where I'm reading from. You guys go to Acts 10, 43. The Bible says in Matthew 26, 28, Jesus speaking, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So Jesus tells us the vehicle, right, of how to have our sins remitted. He goes by the blood of the New Testament, his own blood. You know, picturing the grape juice that they were about to partake in the Last Supper. Okay, so now we know what the, what the vehicle is. It's through the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you guys go to Acts 10.43. Acts 10.43. Now we know what it takes to have that shed blood remitted upon you. Or, sorry, uh, applied upon you. Okay, it says there in verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness, talking about Jesus, that through his name, whosoever what? Believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So is it repenting of your sins that gets you um, 
have your sins remitted of? No. It's by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because His blood, right, was the vehicle of having our sins remitted of. That's how you explain Luke 24. I mean, first of all, Luke 24, 47 is not even saying you've got to repay your sins. Okay? But I just want to show you how easy it is to disprove that it's not. It's by believing on Jesus. It's our faith on Him that has our sins forgiven or remitted, discharged of, of on our account. Now, the other thing, the other way people get around this is they say, they say, okay, yeah, you know what? They admit that repenting from your sins is not in the Bible. They admit that. They admit that phrase is not in the Bible. So what they say then is, well, repentance just means turn from your sins. Just like that word alone, repentance means, the whole, I mean, just the whole thing means turn from your sins. Okay? So if I say to you, I repented from drinking, I repented from drinking orange juice to water, in their minds, well, you must turn from sins. Okay? Because that's what the word repentance means. In, you know, we're already proven that that can't be true. Because we know God has repented more than anybody else. Okay? But the problem with that is, and this shows you just how foolish they are, is that it doesn't make any grammatical sense. Because if repentance, that one word, already meant turn from your sins, then why do they say you have to repent of your sins? If repentance already means turn from your sins. Think about that logic. Repentance already means turn from your sins. So why do you say repenting, repent of your sins? So what you're saying is turn from your sins of your sins. Doesn't make any grammatical sense whatsoever, right? It's like me saying to you, you say to me, Kevin, what must we do to be saved? And I say to you, believe. And I just leave it at that. Because your thought, and let's say to me, believe, that one word means believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you say, Kevin, what must I do to be saved? Believe. You go, well, believe what? Do I believe New Life Baptist Church? Do I believe in you, Kevin? Is that what I need to do to be saved? Believe what? Do I believe in myself? That I'm good enough to get to heaven? No. Obviously, believe needs context. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if believe already meant on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd be saying, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wouldn't make any grammatical sense. And so these foolish people that tell you repentance means turn from your sins, then it's, it's so stupid for them to say repent of your sins. Right? Do you, you get what I'm saying? Repent of your sins of your sins. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever in any grammatical language. Any, any language. Doesn't make any sense at all. It's crazy. But this is, this is what they do. They want to bring in their works. They want to bring in, hey, you've got to be good enough to be saved. You know? It's like, it's so hard for man to admit man. Now I finally realize I can't do enough. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing that I can bring to the table. That's quite hard for a lot of people. You know? And it's like, yeah, yeah, I get, I get Jesus did something for me, but I still need, I still need to do something. No. To let go. Let go of it. Place all your faith, 100%. Believe with all your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what gets you saved. Um, the next thing they'll say to you is, I'm trying to think of, of where to go next. Sorry, guys. I've got a lot to, go, uh, to get through. Oh, they'll say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you don't have to actually turn from your sins. We know nobody can really do that. But you need to turn from habitual sins. Right? You need to stop being a habitual sinner. And because uh, in their mind, when they sin, oh, it's by accident. You know, because the, the, the way they see it is someone that's not saved, they sin on purpose. But now that they're saved, when they sin, it's just by accident. You know, I, I didn't re- I, I was so dumb, I didn't realize I, I'd sinned. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It seems like when they got saved, they became more stupid. Because now they don't even know when they're sinning. Now it's all by accident. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches when we sin, it's coming from the lust of our own heart. Okay, it starts here. And now I said, we can't blame the devil. Okay, yeah, I know that the devil's a tempter, but it comes from our own flesh. It comes from our own heart when we sin. Okay? And the next thing, like, when you think of a habitual sinner, like... When you do something out of habit, you, you pretty much do it every day, right? I mean, if, if I, uh, people that drink coffee every day, right? Someone that drinks coffee every single day, wouldn't you say they're a habitual drinker of coffee? Or someone that needs to smoke every day, you'd say, oh man, that person's a habitual smoker. But what if they just smoked one cigarette? Like they just needed one every day, just one. That's still a habit. Okay, it's a bad habit, having to do that every single day. Or you think of a drunkard, someone that needs to drink alcohol every day. You'd say, that person's a habitual drinker, wouldn't you? The fact that they do it every day. Now, to say you have to stop being a habitual sinner, 
How in the world when every person sins every day of their life? Everyone's a habitual sinner. Everyone. Even the ones that say you need to stop being a habitual sinner. They're the worst sinners. Okay? They've got ha- they're sinning every single day. It's a habit because they've got the flesh. The flesh is still here. The old man, the sin nature is still here. That's, I'm, not, I'm not giving you free pass. Kevin says we can just go ahead and sin. No, I'm just giving you the reality. This is the reality that we sin every day of our life, which is why we needed a saviour. That's the whole purpose for Jesus Christ coming to shed his blood on our behalf. Because he knows we can't do it on our own. Okay, It, it cannot be done. He had to do it for us. The next thing I'll say is, okay, okay, yeah, we realize, yep, that you can't turn from your sins, uh, but you must be willing to turn from your sins. You know, you must be willing to do it. Now, Simon, Matt, I don't work for you guys anymore, right? But pretend, pretend like I didn't resign. Right? Pretend I didn't resign and I was like, but I stopped coming to work, right? Like I resigned, but I didn't really do it officially. I just stopped coming to work altogether. You guys would give me a call and say, Kevin, what's going on? I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I'm willing to go to work, but I'm not, I'm not doing it. Would you accept that? Would you go, well, hold on, Kevin's at least willing to do it. W- would you still pay me every fortnight? <laughs> whatever you were paying, I can't remember what you were paying, was it every fortnight? Whatever. Right, you got this is stupid. You know, why is he coming to work? No, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it. He said, no, there's no profit in you willing to do it. You've got to be here and do the job. All right? So people are saying, oh, I'm, I'm willing to turn to my sin. Hey, look, who cares if you're willing to do it? If you're not, like, yeah. if you're going out, you know, getting drunk, committing fornication, you know, sleeping with prostitutes or whatever, but, oh, but I'm willing to stop, are you kidding me? It, it, you, you get no credit for willing. It's a good thing to will, but it, it, it's only valuable if you do it. And we know that nobody can truly turn from all their sins anyway. And people say, well, no, no, it's the condition of my heart, Kevin. That's what you don't get. You know, God can see my heart. You know, I'm trying my best. I'm trying to stop. But Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You say, my heart's good, Kevin. I'm trying to... You can't even know it. You don't even know your heart. The Bible says it's desperately wicked and it's deceitful above all things. Is that how you want to face God on Judgment Day? You know, you come to God, God, I, I couldn't stop sinning, but I was willing to. You could see my heart. And God says, no, it's wicked. Get out of here. You know, I never knew you. Depart from me, you curse, into everlasting fire. I don't know if I quoted that right. But anyway, that's what God's going to say. Because he's not looking to see how clean your heart is. He's looking to see whether the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been applied to you through faith. Okay? And the last thing they'll say, you know, people, people that get defeated after a while, it's like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. You, we, I realize that, um, you know, I can't stop sinning. I realize that, you know, being willing really, so what? But you've got to have sorrow, okay? If you weren't, you know, crying in sackcloth and ashes and weeping, then you're not really saved. I've heard that. Like, I've heard people say this. If you weren't crying, bawling your eyes out about you, how much of a sinner you are, then you're not even saved. Now, first of all, I don't believe that uh, people that believe this, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe they're unsaved. I believe they're saved, okay? Because I don't believe an emotion is, is, a, is a work. An emotion is not a work, okay? When you get saved, you feel any, all kinds of emotions. You might feel sorrow. You might, you might, it might be genuine. You might, you might really feel sorry for your sins. You know, you might feel joy. You might feel really, you might feel relieved. Oh, I finally understand it. I get it now. You know, it doesn't matter what you feel. Okay. But these people, it's like, no, you've got to feel the sorrow. You've got to feel the sadness. That's how we know you're saved. And of course they'll turn to, and I haven't even got this in my notes. Oh, wait, here it is. They'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Can I get you to turn there? 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. They'll turn to this and say, no, no, here's the proof. Here's the proof that you need to feel sorrow to be saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Actually, let's just read verse 10. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. The Bible says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And if you're not wise, 
you're going to be like, oh wow, maybe, maybe it is sorrow. Maybe you do have to sorrow. Look, it says there, sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Oh man, maybe I, maybe I really need to, you know, maybe I'm not saved. And I need to cry and cry and cry and get these things right with God. No, that's not even what it's saying, okay? In fact, this verse proves that sorrow is not repentance. Why? Look at it again. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. So is it saying sorrow is repentance? No. It's saying that in this verse here, that sorrow brought the Corinthian church to repentance. By the way, it's the Corinthian church. They're saved. Okay? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. And you'll see straight away they're called the saints of God. Okay? Now, it says here that one thing brought to another. If you know the story of the Corinthian church, if you read 1 Corinthians, you'll know this church was really messed up. This church had a lot of problems. They, were, they had a great sinner in the church. They were divided. They had their favorite preachers. They were fighting over doctrine. They weren't even taking the Lord's Supper together. I mean, major problems. And Paul has to correct them, rebuke them sharply in the first letter. And then in the second letter, 2 Corinthians, he says, man, he says, he says if you read it, the chapter, he goes, I, I must repent it for writing what I wrote. But I don't repent, he says. He goes, look. It caused you to have godly sorrow. It caused you to repent to salvation. What was being saved, when you read this context, is their church. It's not about the salvation of their soul. It's about being saved from being a destroyed church. Because they had so much sin. But notice that it's sorrow that worketh repentance. So it's not the same thing. One thing led to the other. Okay? So... Um, I'm just going to quickly read to you from Romans 5, verse 3. I'm going to read to you very quickly this. The Bible says, just to show you somewhere else in the Bible where it says this. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Now pay attention to this. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. Pay attention to those words. You know, tribulation worketh patience. Is the Bible saying that patience is tribulation? You know that's ridiculous. You know, tribulation is persecution from the world, and patience is just being long-suffering. But the Bible's teaching that if you go for persecution and tribulation, it's going to work patience. You're going to be a more patient person. And then it says patience, experience. So once you, once you have patience, you're going to learn experience, and experience hope. Once you have experience, you have a greater hope in the Lord. Okay, one thing leads to another. But is tribulation patience? No. Is patience experience? No. Is experience hope? No. One thing leads to another. The work of is one thing to another. So godly sorrow is not repentance. But in this case, yeah, godly sorrow can lead a church to repent, to fix things up in their own church. Uh, so it's, it's amazing because I feel like the, the people that teach this stuff, it's almost like they've gone down this charismatic road. I don't, have, you, have you ever talked to Pentecostals and about their salvation? They'll often talk about their salvation experience. They'll be like, oh, no, I know I'm saved because I had this experience. And they're talking about some emotional high, some emotional experience. Now I know I'm saved. It's like, now Baptists are doing that. Now you've got to cry and sorrow, and, and now you know you're saved. It's not about your feelings, okay? Because your feelings come and go. You know, sometimes you're not even excited about your own salvation. Your feelings come and go. And when you're not excited about salvation, when you start to lose interest in the Bible, you stop coming to church. You know, if you think salvation is based on how you feel, you're going to get to a point where you're like, man, I don't know if I'm saved anymore. Why? Because you're not basing your salvation anymore on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're basing it on you. You're looking at yourself. You know, am I feeling right? Am I doing the right works? Am I doing it? Hey, salvation is not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. Okay? And as soon as, and that's the big problem, even though I don't, I'm not saying these people that teach this are unsaved, because they're not, they're not adding works to the gospel, but what they do is add a lot of doubt to the, to the church. Okay? Because again, people are going to be like, man, did I repent? Did, did I sorrow enough? Was I really sad enough for my sins? Was I sad for enough for all my sins? You know, was it genuine? I don't know. Was I real about it? What, what, did I cry? Maybe I didn't cry. Now I need to get saved again. I need to go into God crying about it. No. See how it adds doubt and confusion when you start basing your salvation on your feelings. It's just crazy. I'm surprised independent Baptists even teach this stuff. But it's happening. It's happening. Now again, wise as serpents, guys. Harmless as doves. Okay, wise. Be wise. Just because someone says you have to repent of your sins 
does not mean they're an unsaved wolf in sheep's, in sheep's clothing. Okay? A lot of people that I've met in my life um, say this phrase, say these words, and they don't even know what they mean by that word. Okay? Now, I remember in one of my previous churches, there was a, a guy that preached about, against repenting of sins for salvation. Praise God. You know, he preached the truth. He preached the Bible. But then one of the deacons, later on, it, it caused some discussion. And one of the deacons says, well, of course you have to repent of your sins. Like, he was, he, was, he was critical about the sermon. You know, he goes, of course you have to repent of your sins. And I said to him, well, you know, what sins do you have to repent of? And he said to me, well, you've got to repent from the sins that you know about. And I'm like, well, what about the sins that you don't know about? You know? Because, I mean, if, if you've been saved later in life, you probably don't even know all the sins that you've done until you started reading the Bible. Until you started going, well, what? I mean, I remember when my wife got saved, she's like starting to read the Bible, and she's like, wow, my life is like full of sin. Right? She, she didn't even realize what she was doing was, was sinful, right? And, um, and I said to him, well, okay, so are you saying that, you know, let's say you've got two people, this, you know, they both live with their girlfriend, they're both committed fornication, but one knows it's a sin and the other one doesn't know it's a sin. Because here's the thing, most people in this world just don't even realize that's a sin. They don't realize fornication is sin. It's so widely accepted by the society, they don't even think there's anything wrong with it, right? So, are you saying the one that knows it's a sin, that's, he has to turn from it, but the one that doesn't know it's a sin, he doesn't have to turn from it? I mean, is it now built, like, is salvation now just on your own personal knowledge of sin? He goes, no, 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 actually, that's not what I mean. What I mean is that you have to repent of sins, you have to admit that you're a sinner in the sight of God. You know, you need to admit that He's a holy God, He's a righteous God, and that you're not good enough, that you're, that you're a sinner in His sight, and you're deserving of hell. And I'm like, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I don't agree that's what repenting of your sins means, but I agree with you that someone has to realize that first to understand they have a need for a Savior. But do you realize now this man, he was saved, but he's using a phrase that he thinks is in the Bible, because he, he's heard it preached, you know, behind the pulpit, but he knows nobody can truly turn from their sins. He knows that, you know, but the way he used it was wrong, but he wasn't actually teaching a works-based gospel, okay? He just had a wrong uh, a definition for what it means to repent of your sins, okay? So be mindful, like, you know, if someone says you've got to, you know, when you knock on someone's door, or you talk to a fellow Christian, so forth, and they say you have to repent of your sins, don't jump down their throat and try to destroy them. That person might well be saved. You just need to help clarify some definition of terms. Okay? Be mindful about that. Don't just automatically jump down and think they're some wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, you know, I remember, I'll just give you another example. There's these really popular tracks. They're called stop tracks. They're from a, um, a Baptist pastor here in Australia. He's put them together. And I, I, t I kind of like the tracks. Because the tracks have like little images, diagrams, and it helps try, like it, it really does help explain what it means to be forgiven, you know, um, by Jesus Christ. But on the track, the big problem with the track is it asks the question in one place saying, are you, and I don't, I'm not, I might be phrasing this wrong, but it says something like, are you willing to turn from your sins, All right, on the track? Now, uh, obviously we don't believe you have to do that to be saved, but anyway, um, the pastor that put this track together has a video series on, on YouTube teaching how to use his tracks to go soul winning, right? And as he's going through the video explaining how to use his tracks, how to go, you know, from, you know, from the beginning to the end, he gets to that point where it says, you know, are you willing to turn from your sins? And in the video, he says, but of course we know that nobody can truly turn from all their sins. It's like, what? So he knows the truth. He knows nobody can turn from their sins. He knows it's impossible. Then why are you putting it in the gospel tract? And I've told you, I've told you before, this is, why they don't, this is why they do it. Because they know their churches are filled with people that know the truth, salvation by grace through faith, and the other half, no, it's by works, by repenting of sins. In order to maintain, make everybody happy, he's still going to put that in his tract. Even though he himself knows it's an impossibility. You're asking the sinner to do something he knows is impossible. It's crazy. This is why this needs to be preached on. We need to make the gospel crystal clear, guys. You know, and um, I'm, I hope I'm helping you uh, understand this a little, little bit more detail as well. Um, let me just think if I've got another thing to get through. Um, okay, yeah, just one more thing I want to talk about before I... I do have some other notes, but I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up here is, again, be wise, be wise, okay? You might go to a church, you might go to a church, 
And I've heard this in the last sort of five years, roughly. I never heard it growing up. I never heard this 10 years ago, but probably in the last five, six, seven years, I've started to hear people say, preachers say behind the pulpit, repentance is, and you think, all right, they're going to explain what repentance is. We're going to see if they're true in the gospel, or we're going to find out if it's a false prophet. We're going to find out, right? You know, repentance is a change of mind. You're like, yeah, okay. Change of mind. That leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of action. Hmm. I don't know how you feel about that. If, if I stood behind you, if I just said that to you, that's what repentance is. A change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of action. Now, you might go, that's works, Kevin. Well, hold on. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> okay? You know, give, give me a second, right? There's nothing wrong with that definition whatsoever. The problem with it, this is the problem with it, is that it contains zero information. The preacher doesn't tell you what the change of mind is. He doesn't tell you what the change of heart is. And he doesn't tell you what the change of action is. That's, and then this is the problem. Again, you've got the churches that believe in works, some of them, and then others in the congregation that believe it's by faith alone. And both, both people can agree to that. Why? People that believe like us, a change of mind, oh yeah, uh, my works can't save me. My, my false religion can't save me. Which leads to a change of heart. Oh man, I need to humble myself before God because He's the Holy God and uh, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Change of action. I'm going to receive Jesus Christ. Because believe. Believe is a verb. It's an action. I'm going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. So you can see how that terminology can fit even salvation by grace through faith. But then the ones that believe by works, keeping the law, repenting of your sins, will be like, yeah, change of mind. You are, you're a sinner, and that leads to a change of heart. You're, you're now broken down, and, and you, know, you, you realize, man, I, I, you know, God's holy, and I'm a sinner, which leads to a change of action. I'm going to start keeping the law of God. That's, what, that's what's happening, guys. Preachers behind the pulpit are afraid to be honest, afraid to be true, afraid to say what they truly believe, because they're afraid the church is going to split they're afraid the church is going to cause problems. Let's just try to keep the peace. I don't care if they're unsafe. It's crazy. They, they should care. They should just preach the truth. Okay? And if people get upset, that's a good thing. Because now you know they believe in a false gospel. You know they believe in a works-based gospel. Hey, preach the gospel to them so they can get saved. Because if you keep it so vague and open, anybody can make that mean whatever they want. I'm sure if I gave you enough time with that definition of repentance, you can come up with anything. That it can mean any, any, anything. All right, guys. Uh, just in conclusion, just in conclusion, I want to just because I've had accusations made about me about this doctrine that I've changed my view on it. I've I now I no longer teach what I used to believe, or I no longer teach what my previous churches used to believe. That is that is a lie. I believe exactly like my previous churches. I got saved when I was four years old, and then when I was about 20, I went to my first independent fundamental Baptist church. Uh, they're called Southland Baptist Church now. They used to be called Bethany Baptist Church back then when I was there, okay? And that's where I got baptized. And of course, when you get baptized, what are you saying? You're identifying with the gospel that's being preached in that church, aren't you? Are you not? Okay, the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? That's where I got baptized. That's the gospel. That's the church of the gospel that I, that I was in agreement with. And that's where I got baptized. Now let me, let me read to you <clears throat> from that church's statement of faith. That's what it's, this is what it says. We believe that the blessings of salvation are made free to all without obligation for payment. That salvation is not earned or merited in part or in, in, part or in whole by works, rites or rituals. That it, is immediate, sorry, that it is the immediate duty of all to accept salvation. Now look, look at this. By repentance, we talk about repentance, by repentance of any trust in self or works to merit God's forgiveness. And to trust wholly and solely in the blood of Jesus Christ as the payment and full provision for the forgiveness of sins. So how do they define repentance? A repentance from trusting your own works, your own self, right? Uh, that's what we were talked about, right? Where your faith was. Now your faith is on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, not only that, but at the back of this church, they had a booklet. It was called, 
I can't remember what it was called, but it's on our website. If you go to our website, you go to heaven. Oh, that's what it's called. What about repentance? That's what the book was called. And I got permission from the writer to put it on our website, which slightly edited with a few things, just some uh, little mistakes that were on there. Uh, but this is what it says in that booklet, written by the pastor who baptized me. Okay? I want you to understand this. This isn't just me coming up with my own ideas or me following some online preacher. No, this is the church that I was baptized in. In the booklet, it said, We should not, therefore, be calling upon people to repent of their sins in order to be saved. This is unscriptural and confusing for the sinner. Christians should be commanded to work and to do works, meet for repentance. So it's something Christians ought to do, turn from their sins. But to command a sinner to do this for salvation under grace is called another gospel. That was the position of the church that I was at. I've not changed. You know, I've not changed on that. Now, if those previous, if the other churches have changed, that's different. They, maybe they've changed. But I've certainly not changed. I'm in full agreement with that. Anybody preaching you've got to repent of your sins for salvation is preaching another gospel. Another gospel. A gospel by works. And uh, I didn't get to print out Victory Baptist Church, but basically the church that I was in for nine years... I was there, you know, preaching every month. I was a super Sunday school superintendent. If you look at the statement of faith on salvation, basically saying the same thing: salvation cannot be uh, earned or merited by works or uh, personal merit. It says something like uh, purely by um, solely relying on, on your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Something like that. You guys can look it up if you want. I've not changed, and of course, the church in Punchbowl. A lot of you guys are there from there originally. You guys know the stance on repentance in that church as well. Okay? That repentance is where your faith was placed. It needs to be placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a repenting from your sins for salvation. So look, I've had that accusation thrown at me. You've changed. No. Every, a lot of other people are changing. And that's why it's so important that we have a church that stands true on this doctrine. When we go out and knock doors, we teach the right doctrine. A lot of people say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Then you ask them, well, you know, how do you receive salvation? Oh, I repent of my sins. You know. Please, be smart, be wise. Understand that a lot of people that are so-called Christians are not saved. They're still trusting, still boasting in themselves, still boasting in their good works. And um, now, before I conclude, do I believe you have to repent of your sins as a believer? Yes. Do I believe you should be willing to do it? Yes. Do I believe you should have sorrow when you sin? Yes. As a believer, not for salvation, but to clean your life up, to be holy, to be blameless before God, to maintain a, a good fellowship with the Lord. And when you sin, what do you do? You go to the Lord and confess those sins to Him. Not for salvation. You do it to maintain a good fellowship with the Lord, abiding in Him so He can be blessing your life. He can be um, helping you be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, help you develop until at least until you get to heaven where you don't have to worry about this sinful flesh anymore. Okay, let's pray.